Buenas tardes para todos y todas. Muchas gracias por integrarse a esta que es la decimoséptima edición de nuestro espacio de diálogo salada. El día de hoy nos acompaña el profesor Jonathan Gluck Melchior de la Universidad de los Andes con la moderación del profesor Jerónimo Delgado. Eh, hablo un poco de la dinámica de esta sesión antes de darle la palabra a Jerónimo. Tendremos una presentación por parte del profesor de aproximadamente 40 a 45 minutos. Aquellos y aquellas que quieran realizar alguna eh, pregunta durante la intervención podrán utilizar la, eh, la opción del chat. Luego de la presentación, eh, Jerónimo hará una sesión de preguntas de acuerdo con las que aparezcan en el chat y daremos un espacio de aproximadamente 15 a 20 minutos para aquellos y aquellas que quieran generar algún tipo de intervención en sus, eh, con sus micrófonos abiertos. Entonces, daremos también esa opción hacia el final para aquellos que quieran interactuar con el profesor. Por favor, aquellos que se sientan tranquilos escribiendo sus preguntas en inglés, pues pueden realizarlas en ese idioma o si no, si quieren escribirlas en español, no hay ningún problema. Luego, si el profesor las entiende perfectamente, hará su, dará su respuesta en inglés o de lo contrario, haremos alguna eh, interpretación de la pregunta para que él pueda abordarla. Bienvenidos y no, bienvenidas nuevamente. Agradecer, ¿no? a, como siempre, a la internacional, a la doctora Lía Rodríguez de la Vega, quien hoy no nos acompaña, pero ella siempre apoya este espacio y, y hace posible que podamos estar reunidos en esta conversación y no siendo más le doy la palabra a Jerónimo para que pueda hacer la presentación de nuestro invitado de hoy. Perfecto, muchas gracias Tatiana. Buenas tardes a todos. Eh, como les decía Tatiana, hoy nos vamos a dedicar entonces a una presentación del profesor Luke Melchor que se titula África y la guerra de Vietnam, eh, conexiones transnacionales y el internacionalismo del tercer mundo. Lo que vamos a hacer es que lo vamos a presentar a él en español y luego en le, durante la presentación pasa, eh, pasaremos a, al idioma inglés. Para que ustedes sepan, el profesor Melchor es doctor y magíster en ciencia política de la Universidad de Toronto, es canadiense. Es profesor asistente en el Departamento de Ciencia Política de la Universidad de los Andes aquí en Bogotá. Y su investigación se enfoca en debates que abarcan la ciencia política africana y su historiografía. Basándose en un trabajo, en el trabajo de campo en África Oriental durante los últimos siete años en tres países diferentes, que son Uganda, Tanzania y Kenia, ha publicado una serie de artículos revisados por pares sobre la historia política de los movimientos estudiantiles y la política juvenil en África. Pero además de eso, ha trabajado justamente el tema de hoy, y es eh, África o la participación africana en la guerra de Vietnam. Eh, y cuando nos enteramos del tema, nos pareció interesante, quisimos traerlo a, aquí a la a Diálogo Salada, eh, en esta campaña en la que estamos con Tatiana de, de equilibrar un poquito los, los temas de Asia con los temas de África, porque Asia solía tener mucha más preponderancia. Y creo que se ha logrado, ¿cierto Tatiana? Hemos, hemos tenido bastantes temas de África este año y pues para nosotros obviamente es un placer tener, tener a África y tenerlos a ustedes acompañándonos. Entonces, sin más preámbulos, Luke, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you guys very much. Uh, yeah, I want to thank uh, Alada for inviting me to give this talk and uh, for permitting me uh, to deliver it in English. Uh, Jeronimo and Tatiana, I promise uh, the next time that I try to uh, do one of these talks in a forum like this, I'll, I'll try to do it in, in Spanish. Um, I also want to thank my students, both the ones in my classes who are here, uh, but also the students uh, in the Semillero de Estudios Globales. Uh, who did uh, such a great job of helping to uh, promote uh, the event. Uh, my name, as uh, Jeronimo mentioned, is uh, Luke Melchiore. I'm a, a professor assistente in El Departamento de Ciencia Política um, at Universidad de los Andes. And today, uh, my talk is entitled Africa and the Vietnam War, Transnational Connections and Third World Internationalism. It's based on a paper that I co-authored Uh, with a colleague of mine, Dan Hodgkinson, who's a lecturer at the University of Oxford in the uh, Department of uh, International Development. And uh, because of the, the, the perhaps the, sh the strange nature of the topic, I wanted to just briefly say how Dan and I came to work on this uh, subject. In the first half of 2018, um, Dan and I were approached to write uh, 
a chapter about Vietnam War protests in Africa for a Paul Grave Macmillan handbook that was being prepared. Uh, we were both excited by the prospect of conducting this kind of research. There was only one problem. Uh, we weren't entirely sure that there was enough material to actually write a chapter about this topic because there wasn't a lot of literature on it. Um, so we liked the idea of writing the chapter in theory. We thought it fit with some of the other work that we had done, but, but neither of us knew uh, if there was enough material to actually write it. It wasn't until we came across an anecdote from February 1966 that we both became confident that there would be uh, enough material to write the chapter and we both got very excited. So I thought it would be appropriate today for me to start uh, the talk with that anecdote. Um, you, can, you can change the slide, uh, Jeronimo. Um, on February 24th, 1966, picture this, guys. Hundreds of Chinese Communist Party leaders gather in Beijing to host a high-level banquet for Kwame Nkrumah, uh, the man uh, photographed in the slide. He, of course, was the charismatic leader of Ghana, Sub-Saharan Africa's first country to gain its independence from Britain in March 1957. Nkrumah wasn't just Ghana's first president. He was one of Africa's most prominent figures of the era. He was an influential intellectual of African nationalism, and he was an outspoken proponent of non-alignment and pan-Africanism. And following Ghana's independence in 1957, Nkrumah established an ambitious and far-reaching project of decolonization, right? Yet decolonization for Nkrumah wasn't just about transforming a colony into an independent nation state. It was a project of what Adam Getzichu calls world making. That is for Nkrumah, decolonization was about remaking societies and an international system that was to be more egalitarian and free of domination. So implicit in such an ambitious global vision was the notion that Africans could and should play a far more consequential role in world affairs than they had to that, up to that point. Uh, you can change the slide, uh, Jeronimo. Um, now it's important to remember the, the context within which Kwame Nkrumah enters the international stage. Of course, in the early 1960s, we, you have a geopolitical context of escalating Cold War tensions between the Soviet Union and the United States. And so anti-colonial and post-colonial political leaders from across the world began to embrace an idea of non-alignment. In other words, they began to turn to each other and often away from either Washington DC or Moscow. And they began to share imaginations of internationalist political change and community. And they started to work to create the institutions needed to realize those visions. The high point of this collective anti-colonial world-making project, of course, comes at the 1955 Asian African Conference in Bandung, Indonesia. There, leaders from 29 African and Asian countries and liberation movements uh, all come together for the first time and they espouse their collective commitment to disarmament, to the fight against racism and colonialism, and the need to mobilize what Indonesian President Sukarno called the moral violence of third world nations in favor of peace. As Vijay Prashad argues, the most important outcome of this conference wasn't a policy commitment per se, it was the Bandung spirit. That is this belief that the colonized world should claim its space in world affairs, not just as an adjunct of the first and second worlds, but as a player in its own right. And it's from this perspective that the American war in Vietnam for these activists, for these state leaders, for these leaders of national liberation movements, it wasn't just a marginal conflict on the other side of the world. It became an important site of decolonization.
It was the Bandung spirit and Nkrumah's world-making ambitions that led him to Beijing in February 1966. In fact, the Ghanaian president had dismissed advice from his top advisors that he should remain in his country's capital, Accra, because there were rumors circulating that a coup against him uh, was possible. Instead, he decided to travel to Hanoi via Beijing to discuss with Ho Chi Minh and the North Vietnamese leadership the possibility of entering into peace negotiations with the United States. Nkrumah's foreign minister had presented his proposal for peace to the US President Lyndon B. Johnson in August of the previous year. Nkrumah was serious about wanting to play a major role in the world stage in ending this unpopular war. And as some of you may know, and as I expect many of you suspect, Nkrumah's idea, his plan did not go as he intended. In his time away from Ghana, by the time he had arrived in Beijing, Nkrumah's political enemies took advantage of his absence. And on February 24th, 1966, a group of army officers organized and executed a successful coup d'etat, removing him from power. Nkrumah was powerless to stop them. He was no longer the president of Ghana. In Beijing, his own embassy closed their doors to him. His Chinese hosts nevertheless still held the banquet, which Nkrumah had to attend in what Ali Mazrui calls one of the most painful diplomatic occasions in modern history. Now, aside from being what I think is a fascinating anecdote, I don't know what you guys think about it, this story of Nkrumah's banquet is important because it presents a, historical, a historiographical challenge in thinking about the relationships between the war in Vietnam and contemporary histories in Africa. Much of the scholarship on the international dimensions of the American war in Vietnam has focused on protest as the main object of study. And no doubt there has been fascinating work which has explored how the war inspired a generation of young Americans to not only oppose their government's war policy in Vietnam, but also to create new countercultures that challenged the underlying political and social order of US society. Historians of different countries in the West have read the effects of the war in similar ways as it permeated the domestic political settings and cultural discourses in many countries to a surprising degree. Taking such a starting point to a transnational history of the war's effects in Africa, however, is fraught with problems. The recent surge in global historiography carries with it a dangerous inclination of many historians of the global north to universalize Western experiences as a common norm without accounting for the contextual assumptions that such experiences are built upon or the context to which such norms are applied. I'll put it to you simply, guys. To write a history which assumes that protest is the central object of study um, of the Vietnam War in Africa, or which assumes that African protesters of this war were anti-state or countercultural, is to write a story about the global South using a script from the dominant schools of the global North. The imposition of stories and narrative forms, as many post-colonial theorists have argued, can be seen as the essence of colonialism. Yet in avoiding the imposition of unsuitable interpretive frameworks, we should not resort to simplistic narratives of anti-colonial romanticism. Such narratives tend to ignore post-colonial authoritarianism and have created a sense of disconnection between the failures of the post-colonial present and the complex visions of post-colonial futures expressed during the moment of de decolonization. These are two reasons that historians of the global South have been particularly defensive towards global and romantic narratives of historical change. But the critical stance of many Africanist historians towards global historiography 
has led to a tendency of defensive parochialism that can obscure genuine forms of transnationalism. Indeed, when Dan and I, my co-author, were speaking to one prominent African historian about the trans, the lack of writing on transnational histories about Africa and Vietnam, this is when we were starting to write this article, the historian said to us, yes, perhaps there's a reason for that, Luke and Dan, there are none. Nkrumah's banquet, however, attests otherwise. Although many African state leaders and activists at this time were far more concerned by such international issues as the Congo crisis that involved the assassination of Congo's first prime minister, Patrice Lumumba, or the Biafran civil war in Nigeria, or the struggles against white minority rule in Southern Africa, this is not to suggest that the war in Vietnam was marginal to events on the continent. So the question that Dan and I asked ourselves in putting this article together is, how does one write a decolonial transnational history of the Vietnam War in Africa? You can change the slide, Hieronymo. Considering how to approach this problem, thank you, opens up fascinating sets of historical questions, such as what interactions did Africans have with the events in Vietnam during this era? Did the war fire the imaginations and sense of injustice of African political leaders, soldiers, social activists, and publics at large? And if it did, why? Why did it fire their imaginations? And finally, what were the political subjectivities of those that spoke out against the war? And what were their relationships with the state and with their broader political communities? Uh, you can change the slide again, uh, uh, Heronimo. Thank you very much. Um, in making uh, this argument, in attempting to answer these questions, we argue that while the conflict in Southeast Asia did not influence politics and societies on, uh, on the continent in the same way as it did in much of the West. The Vietnam War was significant in many African countries and particularly in contexts where politics was imagined in internationalist terms. As such, the Vietnam War has an important history in African states that aspired to lead non-aligned world-making projects and in Southern African societies engaged in struggles over white minority rule. In making this argument, Dan and I aim to decenter anti-war protests within the historiography of the Vietnam War uh, to one of four sets of transnational relationships that connected African societies to the war. So these are the four transnational relationships that we think connected the Vietnam War to Africa. One military interactions between the North Vietnamese and African liberation movements, particularly in Southern Africa. Two, the role that non-aligned African state leaders played in trying to broker peace in Southeast Asia, leaders like Kwame Nkrumah. Three, the history of African anti-war protests in solidarity with the Viet Cong, the National Liberation Front in Southern Vietnam and the North Vietnamese. And finally, the solidarities forged between white conservatives in the US and Southern Africa, who imagined the war in Vietnam and the repression of African nationalism as two fronts in a broader global struggle against communism. Um, so I don't have time today to discuss in detail all of the four transnational relationships that we discuss in the chapter. I have therefore decided to focus on two of them, uh, mostly because they relate to uh, one of the classes that I'm teaching this, uh, this semester. So I hope uh, that it, it makes sense to my students that are here. First, I outline the role that non-aligned African state leaders played in trying to broker a peace in Southeast Asia which I think many people, uh, this is a history that I think many people are unfamiliar with. Second, I will examine the history of African anti-war protests in solidarity with the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese. Uh, Heronimo, you can, you can change uh, the slide again, uh, please and thank you. An important legacy 
of the Bandung Conference, uh, which I spoke about at the beginning of today's presentation, was a commitment among many third world leaders to the principle of non-alignment. In other words, for many third world leaders of this period, they did not want to formally align themselves to the capitalist West or to the communist East. Instead, they were committed more than anything to pursuing and fighting for decolonization in much of the third world. At the core of non-alignment was the belief that the third world could be a revolutionary force in remaking a more just geopolitical order. While African states did not adhere around a single vision of non-aligned world-making, among the most radical African advocates of this principle, so people like Kwame Nkrumah, people like Mali's uh, Modibo Keita, people like Tanzania's Julius Nyerere, there was a belief that their efforts to enact revolutionary or socialist transformation domestically required an equally strong commitment to anti-colonial world making abroad. For those leaders, Vietnam was a sort of reckoning for their commitment to anti-colonialism and global transformation. By the mid 1960s, a desire to broker peace, to make peace in Southeast Asia became a concrete objective for some of these leaders. While the limitations of such efforts were clear almost immediately as we will see, revisiting the, these diplomatic attempts by African state leaders to shape the events of the Vietnam War reveal an important, often forgotten history of post-colonial African state leaders' early global ambitions. Uh, you can change the slide again, Geronimo, thank you. To understand African statesmen's involvement in, Viet in the Vietnam War, it's first important to recognize the impact of the Congo crisis on their sense of the possibilities and the limitations of non-alignment in the early 1960s. As many of you may know, and some of you may not, the events of the Congo crisis uh, occurred following the country's independence from Belgium in June 1960. And it produced a number of devastating outcomes. One, the country almost immediately, Congo almost immediately descends into civil war when its wealthiest territory, Katanga, decides that it wants to separate. The country's first prime minister, Patrice Lumumba, is assassinated less than a year after coming to power in January 1961. And of course, subsequently, we see the rise and consolidation of the power of the US and Belgian backed military colonel Joseph Mobutu to power. And of course, he becomes one of Africa's most notorious dictators of the post colonial period. But this does not tell the whole story of the impact of the Congo crisis on non alignment. It's important to remember that African leaders like Nkrumah actually helped to organize, staff, and lead the United Nations Operation in Congo forces. In other words, Lumumba goes to the UN during the civil war and he says, I need your help. I need you to send UN forces into the Congo. The UN agrees and India's Nehru and, and Ghana's Nkrumah actually play a central role in leading these forces in the Congo, right? It's kind of hard for us to imagine today, but this is what transpired. Moreover, non-aligned countries angered by the international interference in this newly independent African state, because remember, Belgium, Belgium's interfering, the United States is interfering in the Congo. These non-aligned states come together and they passed the historic resolution 1514 in the UN General Assembly, and those of you that are interested in the history of international relations will, of course, know uh, the, the famous UN uh, um, General Resolution 1514, which affirmed for the first time the importance of granting of independence to all colonial countries and people. The Congo crisis helped to inspire that. So what does this tell us? Well, I think it demonstrates that the legacies of the Congo crisis for non-alignment are complex. While the event certainly showed African state leaders such as Nkrumah, the limitations of their control over international events, right? They couldn't prevent Lumumba from being assassinated. It also demonstrated the possibilities that were open to them 
to advance the normative agenda of decolonization on the world stage. These formative experiences in the Congo, uh, we argue, were an important precursor to the approach that Nkrumah and other African uh, radical non-aligned leaders, uh, non-aligned leaders took to the mounting conflict in Southeast Asia. Indeed, for a brief period in the mid 1960s, African states committed to non-alignment earnestly tried to explore the prospects of a negotiated peace in Vietnam. This was particularly evident following the Johnson administration's announcement in December of 1965 of a peace offensive. So for those uh, that may not be familiar with this, in December of 1965, uh, the US government says they, they're gonna uh, engage in this peace offensive. They're gonna stop bombing North Vietnam. They're gonna call a ceasefire. Uh, they're gonna call for a ceasefire and they're going to look for multinational negotiations to end the war. In the aftermath of this announcement, African proponents of non-alignment join Nkrumah in attempting to persuade the US President Lyndon Johnson to enter negotiations that would put an end to the US war effort in Vietnam. I don't have time to talk about all of the efforts by African state leaders to broker this peace, but I'm gonna focus on two examples. Uh, the first occurs in January, 1966. The post-coup government uh, Algerian government of President Boumediene made a concerted effort to advance the cause of peace in Southeast Asia. Following a 90-minute meeting uh, with the Algerian president and his foreign minister um, with uh, a U.S. envoy, Sophie Williams, Williams excitedly cables Washington, and he says that he sincerely believed that the U.S. government had hit, and I quote, pay dirt as the Algerians appeared genuinely interested in supporting Johnson's peace offensive. Why is this important? Because Algeria had very close relations with North Vietnam. They were thought to be uh, an ideal intermediary. Williams was optimistic, the US in, uh, envoy was optimistic that the Algerians could provide an important back channel to exchange messages between the United States and the NLF and the North Vietnamese. In the aftermath of this supposedly positive meeting, uh, however, US Secretary of State Dean Rusk asserted that he did not want to appear to be negotiating the US's position on this important and fundamental question. He was referring to the possibility of negotiations that included the Viet Cong with third parties only peripherally involved, i.e. Algeria. Such a dismissive message from such a high-ranking US official effectively shut the door on Algeria playing a meaningful role in brokering peace and the opportunity was lost. Both the Johnson administration's resumption of bombing at the end of January, 1966 of North Vietnam and their apparent indifference to African state leaders credible overtures prior to this supported the North Vietnamese government's contention that the peace offensive was an American charade. Uh, you can change the slide, uh, Heronimo. Thank you very much. While efforts among non-aligned African leaders to broker peace in Vietnam effectively slowed down after the U.S. resumed bombing North Vietnam in January 1966, and particularly after Nkrumah's coup d'etat the following month, they did not stop altogether. In late 1967, and my students know that this is a favorite historical figure of mine, Julius Nyerere, Tanzania's president twice attempted to shift international opinion on the Vietnam War in favor of peace. First, he sent a letter to the Pope. Nyerere, of course, was a Catholic, asking the, pro, the, the Pope to talk to uh, President Johnson about the Vietnam War uh, as President Johnson was visiting the Vatican in December 1967. But most notably, in January 1968, in a personal letter to the US president, Nyerere stressed that he believed, based on his discussions with the North Vietnamese diplomats in Dar es Salaam, the capital of Tanzania, that, or then the capital of Tanzania, that North Vietnam were sincerely opening to reaching a peaceful resolution to the conflict. Nyerere wrote that the real question is whether the United States of America, and I'm quoting him here, is powerful enough to be able to talk with the small nation which has defied it and bring those talks to a conclusion, which means peace for the unhappy Vietnamese people. 
and relief to the end, uh, relief to the rest of the world, end quote. In the end, Nureri's peace initiatives came to nothing, like those of Keita, like those of Boumedien, and like those of Nkrumah before him. In all four instances, African leaders with strong connections to communist Asia and a firm commitment to third world internationalism and non-alignment demonstrated genuine interest and initiative in attempting to facilitate communication between the US and North Vietnam and the NLF. In all of these instances, however, their efforts were either formally rebuffed or not taken seriously by the Johnson administration to begin with. As Gene Allman argues, by 1968, the forced removal from power of many of the leading lights of Pan-African non-alignment, whether we're talking about Patrice Lumumba, what, who's assassinated, whether we're talking about Bimbija, who's removed through a coup d'etat, whether we're talk, talking about Nkrumah, who's removed through a coup, or Mali's uh, Moldivo Keita, who's also removed through a coup. Um, they're all removed, these leading lights of Pan-African non-alignment. And this causes, according to Allman, post-colonial Africa to enter a period of reversal and retrenchment. Part of this retrenchment was the abandonment of any African attempt to lead non-aligned mediation of the conflict in Southeast Asia. Increasingly, the conscious rhetorical restraint and moderation that had marked many non-aligned African statesmen's approach to Vietnam for much of the 1960s evaporated. By September 1970, at the third conference of, the, of non-aligned states in Lusaka, in Zambia, the non-aligned movement emphatically called for the immediate, total, and unconditional withdrawal of all foreign forces from Vietnam. At that conference, the greatest ovation was reserved for the foreign minister of the Provisional Revolutionary Government of South Vietnam. While it's important not to romanticize these visions of anti-colonial world-making or the Third World International Solidarity Initiatives that emerged out of them, it would also be a mistake to dismiss these efforts as historically unimportant. Revisiting African attempts to alter the course of the Vietnam War is significant for two reasons. One, it offers an important perspective on the globally ambitious roles that African statesmen aspired to play on the world stage in the years following independence. And two, it also highlights the possibilities and limitations that their non-aligned diplomatic interventions faced in attempting to reshape the global political order you can change uh, slides, Geronimo. Thank you very much. The Vietnam War was not just an issue in state diplomacy and military struggles. It was also taken up by African activists themselves. While most Africans had never been to Vietnam, most African activists did maintain aspirational connections with the Viet Cong, in South Vietnam and the North Vietnamese during the war. This was evident in numerous African protests against US aggression in Southeast Asia. Now, aside from a few exceptions, these anti-Vietnam War protests tended to happen in national contexts where third worldist internationalism had been deeply inscribed into popular political imaginations by nationalist leaders at the moment of decolonization. This shared language between protesters and the state also meant that in contrast to stereotypical images of anti-Vietnam War protesters in the West, African demonstrations in solidarity with the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese were frequently aligned to and sometimes even organized in concert with post-colonial ruling regimes in these African states. The aspirational connections forged in such protests provided one of the main avenues through which the Vietnam War came to animate the lives and political imaginations of many African activists throughout the course of the global 60s. Now, as I mentioned earlier, it's important not to overstate the significance of the Vietnam War in Africa, right? More proximate International events like the assassination of Lumumba, like the unilateral declaration of independence in Rhodesia in 1965, like the Biafran War in Nigeria, and the anti-colonial wars of liberation in Southern Africa. All of those things were far more central 
to the political socialization of the continents of the continent's younger generation in the Vietnam War. Still, as noted, protests in solidarity with the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese did happen in African societies. In rare instances, as in much of the West, the Vietnam War opened public space for new forms of political dissent that were not sanctioned by domestic African governments. I'll give you guys an example. In early January, 1968, Hubert Humphrey, pictured here in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, does like a tour of the US's closest African allies, right? And he actually confronts small protests in, in places like Ethiopia and Kenya, where they do reference the Vietnam War. But most notably, Humphrey arrives in the Congo, in Mobutu's Congo, over seven years or almost seven years to the day of Lumumba's assassination. And Mobutu invites the US vice president to come to Lumumba's monument at the center of Kinshasa. Congolese students organize a protest against the vice president's visit to Lumumba's monument. These protesters held Humphrey accountable for US interventionism in Vietnam and elsewhere. And they also rightly viewed the US government as being one of the main instigators of Lumumba's assassination. In the ensuing protest against Humphrey's visit, 300 Congolese protesters gathered near the monument, pelting vegetables at Humphrey's motorcade, burning the US flag, and chanting pro-Vietnam slogans to the embarrassment of Mobutu. Now, while these Kinshasa protests were definitely memorable, um, and while they more closely resembled our own iconic images of anti-war uh, protests found in the West, they represented the exception in post-colonial Africa. More commonly, as noted, African protests against US aggression in Southeast Asia occurred in those states which were deeply committed to a project of third world internationalism. In such cases, those African governments maintained strong, very public bonds of solidarity with the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong. And many of these African leaders were open uh, to issuing criticisms against US war policy in Southeast Asia. As such, these anti-Vietnam War protests went alongside solidarity campaigns and were either organized in concert with ruling regimes or they received those ruling regimes tacit consent and approval. In equating their own national struggles for liberation, decolonization, or nation state building to those of the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong, these African regimes were encouraging their citizens to see anti-Vietnam War protests as an opportunity to affirm their commitment to their own state's post-colonial vision of world making. At the same time, such protests enabled activists to imagine themselves and their national governments as being one part of a larger third world struggle against imperialism. I'm gonna give you guys three quick examples of how this played out in African states. One is from Western Africa, we're gonna talk about Mali. The other is from North Africa, we're gonna talk about Algeria. And we're gonna conclude by talking about another example from East Africa, uh, and that will be Tanzania. So in Mali, uh, you can change the slide again, Hieronimo, thank you very much. In Mali, the country was led by uh, Modibo Keita. Since coming to power in September 1960, the Malayan socialist leader had proven himself to be a committed Pan-Africanist. He'd welcomed members of the Nigerian Sawaba opposition movement into his country. He'd allowed the armed wing of Algeria's FLN to actually train on Malayan soil. His ability to, uh, to impress John F. Kennedy in a meeting with the US president in Washington prior to the Belgrade Non-Aligned Conference and his leadership role in mediating an African-led peace agreement between Algeria and Morocco over a border dispute in September 1963 had confirmed Keita's reputation as a articulate African spokesperson for non-alignment. Moreover, like Nkrumah, the Malayan president had made a point of publicly aligning his regime to the North Vietnamese. He allowed the North Vietnamese to maintain an embassy in Bamako, 
He consistently and publicly criticized US imperialist aggression in Southeast Asia. And in October, 1964, Keita even goes to North Vietnam on a friendship visit. He meets with Ho Chi Minh and the two leaders release a joint communique at the end of their meeting that commits both of their governments to national struggles for independence against, and I quote, bellicose and aggressive imperialism. In March, 1965, several thousand Malayan laborers made their way from the headquarters of the government aligned National Union of Malayan Workers to the US embassy in the capital of Bamako to protest US imperialist interventions in Asia and Africa. Once there, the demonstration, which was led by the organization's general secretary, Mamadou Sissoko, echoed the president's party line on Vietnam. They condemned the colonialist policy of American imperialism in Southeast Asia, and they equated US interventions there with the provocation staged by American imperialism in the Congo and in Uganda. In reiterating Keita's position on Vietnam, such public declarations of solidarity with the NLF and the North Vietnamese on the part of Malayan officials and citizens could also be read as a demonstration of the protesters continued commitment to not only the internationalist third world struggle against US imperialism, but also their loyalty to Keita's US RDA regime. In Algeria, we find a similar story. The revolutionary FLN government there encouraged and organized public displays of solidarity with the Viet Cong. In December 1966, as the Algerian government formally hosted the North Vietnamese ambassador to Algeria, the FLN government declared a national Vietnamese solidarity week to commemorate the sixth anniversary of the creation of the Viet Cong. The week's festivities included a demonstration in front of the US embassy where several hundred Algerians condemned what they called the criminal war waged by the United States in Vietnam. At the end of this week of solidarity, a mass meeting of students and workers met to protest the war, chanting, Johnson is a murderer, Yankees go home, down with US imperialists and long live Vietnam. These protests very much echoed again official proclamations of the post-coup government of Boumedien, who in that same month announced the creation of an Algerian committee of investigation into US crimes in Vietnam. And this was remarkable. This organization brought together all government aligned national organizations in Algeria, and it tasked them with the job of, and I quote, investigating the crimes committed daily by the Americans in South Vietnam. Finally, the case of Tanzania also attests to the importance of the Vietnam War uh, played in animating the domestic political landscape of some African countries. Throughout the 1960s, largely on account of the popular appeal of Nyerere and his unique brand of African socialism, Ujamaa, Dar es Salaam had developed into a hub of decolonization. Angela Davis, uh, Malcolm X, Che Guevara, they all visit Dar es Salaam during the 60s, right? Within this vibrant political context, unfolding events in Southeast Asia were followed closely. Yet for much of the early stages of the Vietnam War, Nyerere had remained somewhat reluctant to publicly criticize the American war policy in Southeast Asia. This changed, however, in October 1967 when the Tanzanian president delivered a scathing critique of US foreign policy in the region. He brandished the war, and I quote, as probably the most vicious and all enveloping which has been known to mankind. And he urged the US to effect an immediate and unconditional end to the bombing of North Vietnam. In the aftermath of Nyerere's speech throughout the first half of 1968, as George Roberts notes, public displays of solidarity between North Vietnam and Tanzania became common. As in Mali and Algeria, many of these displays were organized by the ruling party. Most notably in January, 1968, the university college branch of the Tanu Youth Wing organized a protest outside of the US embassy in Dar es Salaam. The protest concluded with Tanzanian students making their way to the North Vietnamese mission in Dar es Salaam, singing songs in praise of Julius Nyerere, their leader, and of Ho Chi Minh, the leader of North Vietnam. And they even dropped off a solidarity note to that North Vietnamese mission. 
which declared the Vietnamese fight was our fight or the Vietnamese fight is our fight. As with demonstrations in Mali and Algeria and Tanzania, African protests against US intervention in Vietnam did not follow the pattern most commonly associated with anti-Vietnam demonstrations that emerged in the West. In these African cases, protesters were not publicly opposing the foreign policy of their national government as it related to the war. On the contrary, they gathered on the streets of African capitals to reaffirm their continued belief in the incipient political and ideological projects of their post-colonial states. In declaring that the Vietnamese fight was their fight, these African anti-Vietnam war protests were attempts by African activists and the states that they swore their allegiance to, to mobilize support for state leaders in increasingly tense domestic circumstances and to reaffirm their commitments to anti-colonial world making in which they imagine themselves side by side with the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese against the forces of Western imperialism. When Dan and I initially agreed to sign on to write this chapter, our biggest concern, as I mentioned, was that there was not going to be a there there, right? What we have realized over the last year, and I think what our paper demonstrates quite clearly, is that the US war in Vietnam was far from a footnote in African history. Yet at the same time, it is important to stress that the war did not shape politics and society on the continent as it did in the West. Through concrete and aspirational relationships, the conflict was bound to specific contexts across the continent, in particular and often divergent ways. Today, I have highlighted two of those transnational relationships. First, um, non-aligned African leaders saw in the war an opportunity to realize their own world-making ambitions. High profile African nationalist political leaders such as uh, Nkrumah, Keita, Boumedien, and Nyerere sought to shape the course of the war by taking concrete steps to bring warring parties to the negotiating table. These efforts were largely stifled by the late 1960s as Cold War insecurities over the role of the third world caused US and Soviet interventions that silenced the independent voices of non aligned world making. The Vietnam War's impact on African societies was also felt beyond the world of foreign policy and military strategizing. While protest against US aggression in Southeast Asia was not as widespread in Africa as in much of the West, such protests did occur in cases where post-colonial African leaders had their own world-making visions. In such contexts, African protests in solidarity with the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese were organized in concert or with the approval of ruling regimes. These protests were affirmations of a belief in anti-colonial world making and the power of third world internationalism. Moreover, they helped post-colonial states to legitimize their rule in increasingly fracturous and challenging domestic political uh, arrangements. Thank you guys very much. So we don't need the conclusions. I forgot to change the slide here on Okay, Paul. cool. No, it's yeah. fine. It's fine. All right. Thank you very much, Luke. Um, Tatiana, I think it's the first time we actually link Asia and Africa in a conference. It, 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 was, it was quite interesting. It's great. Thank finally, you. Finally, we are together. Yeah, finally, we're together. <laughs> right. Um, Luke, there are a few questions for you in the chat room. Okay. I will, I will read them for you. The first one comes from Lorena Janis. She asks, do you think this South-South cooperation came from an African foreign policy based on multilateralism or was it just a generalized sense of solidarity in the population? Also, were these protests mainly led by young people or was it the whole citizenship, the whole population? Okay, so I, I should address the questions one by one. So I think, one of the things uh, that's really interesting uh, to me about teaching, uh, especially you know, uh, the political economy of development in, in Colombia, in the global south, is I actually prefer the word third world because uh, I like the political connotations of it. The, the kind of, for me, it, it signifies a, a, a sense of solidarity and possibility that I associate with the 1950s and the 1960s. In Colombia, generally speaking, people hate that word because at least in my experience, because they see it as suggesting that uh, 
countries in the third world are somehow third class citizens. So it's interesting that Lorena uses South-South uh, cooperation, which is kind of the more, uh, uh, what's, what's the right word? It's the more appropriate designation that we use these days, instead of talking about third world internationalism or third world uh, solidarity. Uh, so I definitely think that for the, the leaders that I talked about today, for people like Nkrumah or Nyerere, they had a deep commitment to a certain understanding of Pan-Africanism. So they, they were trying to create uh, continental organizations and, and solidarity through which they could act on the world stage as a block. Um, and of course, uh, as many of you guys will be familiar, such efforts faced a number of challenges and, and often uh, weren't able to uh, achieve the objectives that they desired. So certainly uh, there was a commitment to uh, some, a, a kind of non-aligned foreign policy, and there was the hope of generating solidarity among these third world uh, countries uh, during this period of time. To the question of youth, uh, it, it depends. I mean, the protests that we talked about, certainly in the Tanzanian example, when we're talking predominantly about university students, a protest led by university students, that was certainly a protest that was uh, led by and participated in, uh, in, in the majority by youth. When we talk about uh, what we saw in Mali, where it was more led by labor unions and, and in uh, Algeria, where it was probably more of a broad cross section of the, of the population, it's a bit different. But we don't really see the, the same kind of countercultural uh, Vietnam protests that we'll see in, in places like the United States or West Germany, right? So it's a very good question. Thank you, Lorena. All right. Um, question number two. It's it's a bit, I, I don't know how to put it. They, uh, Juanita Murillo says, look, I didn't understand very well the non-alignment thing. Okay, so I tried to explain this in the talk, but I'm happy to, to go over it again. So when I refer to non-alignment, um, this was a foreign uh, policy adopted by uh, countries in the third world or in the global south uh, coming out of the Second World War during this era of decolonization, where they consciously made an effort to not formally align themselves with the capitalist powers of the West, so the United States, the United Kingdom, France, or the communist bloc of the East, so the Soviet Union. So the, the, the idea uh, of non-alignment was that these states in the global south or the third world would turn to each other, right? And that they would try to devise independent uh, foreign policies that were independent of Cold War geopolitical calculations. And they actually created a non-aligned movement, which meets for the first time in Belgrade, uh, in September of 1961 and, and meets again a couple of times during the 1960s. And this non-aligned movement was very much an offshoot or a descendant of the Bandung conference that I talked about at the beginning of the presentation. I hope that clarifies uh, any confusion, Juanita. All right, connected to that, Lorena is also asking, is this phenomenon directly connected with the global 60s? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I would say absolutely, Juanita. I mean, when we're talking about third world internationalism, we're really uh, talking about state leaders, activists, political organizations, liberation movements that are trying to generate a sense of solidarity among these non-aligned countries of the global south or of the third world. And you have to remember this conception of third worldist solidarity or third worldist internationalism is being conceived in a moment where a lot of these forces are trying to promote and support the fight against decolonization, which as uh, you know, Lorena from our class, continues well into the 70s in, in, in parts of Southern Africa and indeed in the case of Zimbabwe uh, into, into 1980, right? So they are committed to trying to generate and institutionalize a, a sense of solidarity among these global South countries. And they're also committed to fighting for decolonization, fighting against racism, uh, fighting uh, for disarmament. Um, and, and that was a big part of their project. And so this is indeed a very crucial part of what we come to understand as the global 60s. All right, thank you, Luke. There's another question. Um, how do you see the situation of future negotiations by v Vietnam with Africa? What would be the Vietnam objective? 
So I have to, uh, I think it's always important and pertinent for academics to acknowledge when they don't know something. Uh, I am not very, very familiar uh, with the contemporary relationship between Vietnam and independent individual African states. It's a wonderful, wonderful question. And I expect, uh, Dan and I are hoping to make this a bigger project just because we found so much material. And I expect if we continue on this road, I'll be able to answer that question better in the future. Uh, but today I have to admit, I, I don't know much about uh, Vietnam's relationship with, with uh, individual African states. All right, we have another question from Agustina Jimenez. She asks, was the Vietnam War the start of a new era of social movements around the world? Uh, that is a very, very good question. And again, I think as the presentation today suggests, it's, it's really important not to see the Vietnam War as having a uniform, homogenous impact on societies across the globe. So what I would say to you is it depends where you ask that question. Uh, certainly in, in African states, as we talked about today, uh, the impact of the Vietnam War was nowhere near as significant to the political socialization of the younger generation as it was in the United States, for example, or as it was in Western Europe. I know in the case of Latin America, uh, there's a, a big literature, a global 60s literature in Latin America, where there, the real argument is, look, the, the events of, of the French May and the and kind of anti-Vietnam protests, these were things that informed what was happening in Latin America, but they were not things that was driving uh, youth protest in Latin America. So it's important, I think, as we mentioned at the beginning, to not take scripts from the global north and apply them to the global to explanations of what happens in, in societies in the global south. Certainly in the United States, I think the, the civil rights movement and the, the kind of emergence and acceleration of the Vietnam War was crucial to the radicalization of a generation of young people in the United States. And I think that would apply in certain Western uh, European countries like France, Italy, uh, and West Germany as well. All right, thank, thank you, you Luc. Um, there's another question that just, we just got. As I and it comes from Mateo Riveros. As I understand, most African leaders had the intention of, inf to inf of influence to get a peace to get a peace talking and a cease of fire. But do you know if someone tried to be part of the process of peace building in a direct way or through a multilateral organization such as the, U the UN? So uh, maybe I didn't explain this point well enough. Uh, Kwame Nkrumah basically, I mean, one of the, the remarkable things about our paper is Kwame Nkrumah basically loses power because he leaves Ghana to try to seriously pursue a peace deal between the United States and North Vietnam. This was not window dressing, right? I mean, you can criticize Nkrumah maybe for having a grandiose conception of his importance on the international stage, but he really risked his political fortunes and career by going to North Vietnam. And, and as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, the year before his foreign minister had talked with President Lyndon Johnson about the possibility of brokering a peace deal with Vietnam. So Nkrumah was committed to legitimately playing a central role in a, in a peace deal that could be brokered between the two parties. In the case of Algeria, as I mentioned, they meet with the United States. They say, look, we're open to playing a, a major role in bilateral uh, peace negotiations. And then the US backs away from it. In the case of, of Tanzania, Nyerere also reaches out uh, through a personal letter, both to the Pope, says to the Pope, look, can you talk to this guy and, and try to get him to see right from wrong? And then later delivers a personal letter to Johnson. And remember, the Tanzanian ambassador, the, the, the US ambassador in Tanzania says to Johnson and the Secretary of State, Dean Rusk, you send a formal representative to Tanzania. Nyerere is very close with the North Vietnamese and the Chinese. He could be very useful in brokering a peace deal. You should be taking this seriously. And Johnson refuses to take it seriously. So these were serious efforts on the part of these African leaders. They weren't necessarily going through the United Nations, but that shouldn't diminish how seriously we take these efforts on the part of these African leaders. Yeah. Juanita Murillo asks, so the non-alignment deal 
is what protesters wanted to impulse. Uh, I wouldn't see it in that way. I think it's more important to kind of see that the non-alignment foreign policy of state of these kind of leftist states like Ghana under Nkrumah, Tanzania under Nyerere, Mali under Keita, it was part of how these protesters imagine themselves in, in, on a broader global scale, right? And it's important to note, not everybody agreed uh, with these projects, right? I mean, Keita becomes increasingly unpopular after 1964, Nyerere less so, and obviously Nkrumah is removed in a coup that's popularly received in 1966. But I think it's more, the, the point I'm trying to make is their foreign policies were a part of their nation building projects at home. As I said at the start of the presentation, for these leaders, decolonization wasn't just uh, you know, a nation state getting independence. They imagined this project of decolonization as being about reordering the geopolitical order in a more just egalitarian way. And certainly a lot of their citizens, a lot of their supporters at home bought into this idea of non-alignment. All right. So, Luke, I'm going to ask you a question, and I'm sure. going to go where I shouldn't go. Please do. <laughs> because you said you, were, you weren't going to do it. Um, I'm actually curious about the other two points you didn't mention in your presentation, about these links, these military interactions between North Vietnamese, um, between the North Vietnamese and the African liberation movements. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, and also, I, the fourth one, uh, these uh, solidarities between white conservatives in the US and Southern Africa. Yeah, so this is very, I'm guessing very is, which I'm guessing was the apartheid system in South Africa, the apartheid regime. Well, actually, what we talk about in the article, so the fourth point, um, we're talking about efforts by the Rhodesians. Oh, uh, Rhodesians, okay. Which, which came to be Zimbabwe. They actually reached out to, so white supremacists uh, in white nationalists in Zimbabwe reached out to conservatives in the US and they tried to uh, generate uh, fundraising and linkages of solidarity. And the argument that they were making is, you guys are fighting communism abroad in Vietnam. We are fighting uh, communism at home. And because they were trying to say that these African nationalists who were fighting for their independence in Rhodesia were actually another front of this kind of communist incursion, right? And they were trying to generate uh, solidarity and to gain support from the US. Now, Lyndon Johnson never really gave them the time of day, um, but it is interesting that we see Vietnam veterans coming back from fighting in Vietnam who eventually go to fight for the white nationalists in Rhodesia. So there are all of these fascinating transnational connections that we find. And then of course, the first point is uh, and it's a really interesting part of the paper, which is that um, a lot of Algerian soldiers had fought with the French against the Vietnamese who were fighting for their independence. And so through that process of fighting uh, on the side of the, co the colonialist against the anti-colonial army, they were actually subject to a lot of propaganda from the, the North Vietnamese, right? And, or from the Vietnamese. And a lot of those soldiers returned to Algeria and thought to themselves, wait a second, we were just fighting on the side of the colonialists against these guys that we saw as kind of being admirable because they were fighting for their independence. Why aren't we fighting for our own independence at home? And the linkages between Algeria and North Vietnam are fascinating. So General uh, Jap, uh, famous uh, North Vietnamese general actually uh, advised um, liberation movements in Algeria and in Southern Africa on what he believed the best strategies they could use to uh, defeat colonialism in their country. So there was actually literal connections between North Vietnam, Rhodesia, South Africa, and Algeria, where military strategy and, and, what, and what we call revolutionary soldiering, these linkages were, were made. Um, and it's a very fascinating part of this history as well. Yeah, it's it's quite interesting that the linkages between between white supremacists in the U.S. and white regimes in in, in Southern Africa were with with Rhodesia, not with the apartheid regime in South Africa, which was so, a big one. So again, it's really important to say, uh, Geronimo, for us, this is this is the beginning. So this is not to say 
that if you, it, you know, we may have time to explore the South African archives and find similar kinds of connections. Okay. Uh, my, my colleague, Dan, is, is a historian of Zimbabwe. So that's why well, we that explains the okay. article. But I, we, I think we try to make it clear this is an introductory article. It's not exhaustive of all of the different connections, and we're very excited to explore those in the future. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because the, the, the South Africans were quite um, active in destabilizing all these movements in Africa, yeah, in Zimbabwe, for, in Rhodesia, for example. Absolutely. All right. Um, there's another question from Juan Felipe Gomez. He asks It's clear that there was a big support from some African leaders to Vietnam, but were they any internal changes they did in their governments by learning from the Vietnamese case? So I think this, this gets to uh, Jeronimo's question, which is that absolutely um, the, the African liberation movements, and when we bring up some of these examples in, in the article, learned from and gained insights from uh, North Vietnamese military strategy, the North Mi Vietnamese struggle against the United States certainly was a source of inspiration uh, for liberation struggles in, in countries like uh, Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau, Angola, South Africa, uh, Zimbabwe. Um, so there, there were definitely uh, instances where the struggle in, in Vietnam helped to inform struggles against uh, colonial oppression, in, particularly in Southern Africa. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any other questions? We could even open the microphones for for real life questions, like questions live. You can Anyone raise else? your hand slowly. If many people can speak at the same once, want to speak at the same time. <laughs> okay. Yes. I have one question that I'm doing to everybody now, and it's uh, all the pictures that you, that you showed are men. Yes. And it's because history has, are, are made basically by men, or are, we are told that are is made by men. I would like to know more about women and how they were involved, or if you have many either ideas how how women were uh, featured on these all these things. African women. So this is a great question, uh, Tatiana. And I actually had this thought as I was putting together the slide today. I said, oh shit, this is just a bunch of men. Um, and, and, the, and again, I, I have to be completely frank because of the nature of the project. Um, part of it is uh, our focus was kind of in, in some sections of the paper top down, like we were talking about a certain kind of diplomatic history and, and military history. But the answer uh, about uh, the, the involvement of, of women in these protests, for example, at the yes. moment, the answer is we just don't know. Um, that uh, it's, it's a, we're at a very early stage of the project and I absolutely hope that this paper yes. will inspire people to look into those kinds of questions because it would be great to be able to get access to archives and actually get a better sense of who were the people involved in these protests? What, what, was, what was animating their political imaginations and inspiring them to participate? And what was the role of, of women in, in, these, um, in these political activities? It, it's fascinating. It's a fascinating question and a very important one, but it's not one that I have the answer to at the moment, unfortunately. Yeah. But it's, it's also quite hard to find like prominent women in the whole uh, liberation struggle in Africa and, and, and like the main leaders are usually men in I, Africa I, in yeah, particular. I think, I, think that's, I think that's largely true. Although, you know, you, you see uh, certainly in, in Mozambique struggle uh, for independence, uh, women played a big role in Tanzania, even though- South Africa. A, yeah, South Africa and Tanzania struggle, even though it wasn't a military one, the women's movement was absolutely essential and, and front and center uh, to their achievement of independence. So it's a great question, uh, Tatiana, and I think it's, it's something that in some of our future work could be a really fruitful avenue to explore. No, um, what I meant is that the main key leaders, the one you usually see in pictures, are usually men. I'm not saying that women did not have a, a huge participation. If you look at the Western Sahara, for example, women play a key role. If you look at the yes. fall of apartheid, women play a key role. Yes, they're absolutely. just not the key um, people, the key guys in the pictures. They're, they're just not there. Yeah. 
at the top positions. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, a, it's yeah. a really interesting point. Yeah, yeah. That, that's basically that, the thing that I want to change in our, specifically because we teach and we want uh, our students to, to be in a world where women also count. So I think it's important to have both or at least make the effort to recognize and acknowledge those women that also were important in the making this history possible. So Absolutely. Think, uh, and the thing is, Tatiana, it's not as if that stuff doesn't exist, right? I mean, there are vibrant histories uh, and, and absolutely they need uh, to be included and uncovered. And again, my only uh, justification with this project is we are literally at the tip of, of an iceberg. Yeah. And we're, we're just trying to, we didn't even know what existed a year ago. So we're just trying to kind of go deeper and deeper into this. And of course, what we're hoping is a number of other scholars begin to look at how this played out in individual African countries. That's our aspiration, yeah. Great, right. thank you. Do we have any other questions from the public? O en español, tenemos más preguntas del público. Sí, en español también puede ser. Pueden ser preguntas en español si las quieren hacer en el chat o si las quieren hacer en el, directamente con el micrófono. Con el micrófono. O Lo si sabemos. alguien está interesado en interactuar con Luke, quieren preguntarle algo, alguien le interesa hacer una tesis de este tema, todas esas opciones son posibles en este espacio. Muy bien. I want to ask if he can recommend literature or information that we can read about this? So, uh, it's a great uh, question. Is that Agustina? Agustina. Oh, yes. Thank, yes. You. thank you. I don't think I, I've met you before, but thank you so much for uh, the question. Um, I really like, and I assigned this to my class this semester, it's like eight pages. It's an article by Jean Allman. I think it's called The Fate of All Things. It's short, it's, it's beautifully written, and it captures uh, the spirit of, of the times. Um, that, that's one that I, I would definitely recommend. There's another uh, article by Victoria Langland, um, which is actually about, she's actually writing about Brazil, but she's talking about different kinds of transnational connections that link together movements. Uh, I think it's in the Rutledge Handbook of the Global 60s. That's really good as a theoretical reading. And then I would say, novels and i know that's a strange thing for a political scientist to recommend but i am uh, I, I am a reluctant political scientist i guess but you know there's a beautiful novel uh, the beautiful ones are not yet born uh, by aikwe arma which is about the days leading up to the coup in ghana and the novel beautifully captures the sense of disappointment and disillusionment that people felt as a lot of these titanic heroes of liberation began to, to fail them. Uh, and then more contemporary stuff, uh, Chimamanda Adachi Ngozi's uh, Half of the Yellow Sun, which is about the Biafran uh, civil war, uh, is a beautiful book. I mean, it's just one of those great, you'd, you'd say it, it, where I come from, it's a summer read. I mean, it's not, it's not work. It's, it's, uh, you'll, you can read it in a week and you'll love it. Um, I'm trying to think, but yeah, I, the beautiful ones are not yet born. Ai Koyarma, um, Half of the Yellow Sun would be another one. Uh, Almond for sure. I really like a book. It, it depends what part of the continent you're interested in, uh, Agustina, but I really like a book called Cultured States. And that's just because I'm obsessed with Tanzania and Jewish Nyerere, but it talks about youth movements in Dar es Salaam in the 60s. And it has a full chapter on women's movements, for example, in that book, and, and, and struggles over things like the miniskirt in Dar es Salaam uh, society in the 1960s, but it also talks about the student movement. Um, Dan and I have written um, uh, an introduction about student movements in, in Africa in the 1960s, and we're working on a book uh, for the, I don't know if people know the African Arguments series, but it's put out by, um, Hearst publisher in Oxford University Press. And we're working on a book about the history of African student movements and the politics of decolonization, which of course is a big topic these days. Uh, and so when that's out, I, I would recommend that uh, in an in a effort to shamelessly self-promote. Um, but Agustina, can you give me your email and I will, I'll, I'll come up with like a mix tape. Yes, I was thinking actually if you can give us all of us uh, 
you can give me some of these references and I will share with the whole list of people who, uh, who were in the list of uh, attendees. Okay, and I also want to say uh, a, a, a student of mine that, that did a wonderful master's thesis with me just reminded me, I have made a playlist for my class on youth politics, which is 65 songs of um, classic US pop okay. music in the 1960s in chronological order. Uh, I consider it to be a musical history of the 1960s because you start off with like, you know, basic simple songs and you end with songs about drugs in the Vietnam War. Um, okay. And so I would love to share a link with people because nobody's listened to it and I spent hours making it. So uh, <laughs> okay. I, I hope uh, that's that great. Okay, yeah. Lorena says she has. Thank you, Lorena. Yeah. Don't um, lie, she says. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we need a, um, a playlist of African songs about so the 60s. We, we do need that playlist, but Jeronimo, again, I know what I know and I know what I don't know. We need somebody that knows that music well to make that beautiful playlist. It is not me, but uh, I would love <laughs> that playlist too. Okay. If anybody wants to do that work, I would love uh, that playlist. I, I think I, I have a record on my iTunes of, of uh, beautiful music from Burkina Faso of that period, Burkina Faso of that period. Uh, I could share that, but I can't claim to be an expert or, or an authority on that, on that, on, on the continent's music of that period. Yeah. Although right. Fela Kuti, I can recommend, uh, but, but yes, I, so, and that's wonderful political music. Yeah. All right. Yeah, you so can send to... all, all what you want and I can share with all. The people all right. that we're going to have to sort that out, the, the other uh, playlist. Yes. So yes. look, everybody's listened to it. Lorena, Martin. Well, you have to, you have to say, uh, Jeronimo, I, I really do have wonderful, wonderful uh, people that take my classes who I uh, like a great deal. And some of them have shown up. So it, uh, the it's kind of, there's a loop bias at the moment, which I greatly appreciate. Yeah. That's great. Okay, all right. Um, do we have any other questions or comments? Yes, I do have a question. <laughs> Go for it. Um, look, is that you mentioned before, like in your presentation, that there were, I mean, there were like um, protests in many African places, um, in, like in regard of the Vietnamese war. But I, I have like the question, like what happened? I know that I already did this kind of question, but what happened like with the governments in terms of, I don't know, like structural changes? Were there any structural changes or were was there any response or it was, it was just like this kind of protests that happened because they were not like against the government, but against, you know, like US imperialism. Were there any like really felt changes inside of these, um, like in these countries? It's, it, it's like trying to make a relation with those pro student protests that happen in, in, in many other places that had some response from the state, like or a positive one or a negative one, but what was a response like what was the official response to these protests? So I think it's important to say a couple of things. One is uh, that there weren't protests in many African countries. I think that would be an overstatement. One of the points that we're trying to make in the article is the, the protests tended to happen in those countries where uh, they were largely acceptable. Right. I mean, the, remember, I, we, we talked about the pelting of tomatoes at Humphrey's motorcade in in uh, Congo that embarrassed Mobutu. He was not happy with that. In most cases where we see these protests, they're kind of happening. They're being sanctioned by these ruling parties, the FLN in Algeria, Tanu in Tanzania, um, uh, Keita's regime in Mali. These are this is a safe subject to protest. And in many cases, it's either being organized in collaboration with the ruling party or the ruling party is happy that these protests are going on. Um, so these protests weren't emerging everywhere and they didn't have the countercultural anti-state dimension that they had in the United States or in Western Europe. So generally speaking, uh, these protests uh, were not like the cause of state repression against the protesters, largely because the state was on the protesters side. Now it raises interesting questions. Right, which is, you know, you could a, a criticism of the paper could be, well, Luke, they were just protesting because they were living under authoritarian regimes and, you know, um, 
and, and they were just trying to kind of curry the favor of their governments. But I would respond to that. Why were the protests centered on an issue like the Vietnam War? Because I do think in much of the global South, the Vietnam War was something that particularly among these leftist regimes that people, ordinary people on the street could get behind. The idea of a small country uh, where the majority of the population, uh, where it was a kind of peasant economy being attacked by the most powerful country in the world. This was something that people could unite around. The thing that I keep thinking about, and I hope that some of my wonderful students who are here, I know nothing about how Vietnam and the, and the war was received in Latin America, almost nothing, and especially in Colombia. I really, really hope that somebody does a, a master's thesis on this question. What was, how was the Vietnam War received in Colombia? I have no idea. I've asked people, most people I talk to don't know, but it's a fascinating area of research. Again, there is the risk that Dan and I had, maybe there's nothing there and you'll be wasting your time, but it would be great to talk to activists from the late sixties and early seventies and ask them, was this part of what was being spoken about? Uh, I don't know the answer. I would love to know the answer. I hope uh, some of the, the brilliant students here find it out for us. All right, any other questions? All right, um, Luke. I don't even know if it's a question or not. It's quite interesting to see that um, one of the most important wars in Southern Africa, not, not the 60s, but in the 70s, was the Angolan War. And it was actually called the South African Vietnam War. Yes. And, and, and maybe we're not talking about direct links, but we're talking about uh, learning from the Vietnam War in terms of military tactics or no, it's a great point, Geronimo. And actually, we did a, me and Dan did a, a panel in uh, Scotland a couple of years ago, and we tried to get a, somebody to write on this. Because even like to write about Vietnam at the level of metaphor in Southern Africa, because you hear mm -hmm. this a lot in South Africa, you know, this is South Africa's uh, Vietnam. I think that's would be a fascinating paper, like the way in which Vietnam and the war in Vietnam was deployed as metaphor uh, in, in understanding South Africa's regional politics at the time. I, I would, yeah, I think it's a great idea. I'm not, uh, I'm not an expert on that topic, but I do think it's another area that this project could go in. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's quite interesting because I've seen it with the Balkans as well, the balkanization of, and then that concept is used for other types of wars in yes. other types of, in other regions of the world so it's, yeah. it would be it would be fantastic to look into that yes. um does anybody else want to say anything else it's now it's not about questions it's more about a conversation i think the the session went that way which is amazing i, I, I just want to can i just say Geronimo, that um i, I just want to thank you know 40 people coming to listen to a talk about the Vietnam War in Africa uh, is remarkable. Now, some of my students are going to get a bonus for doing this, so it's not all uh, natural love, uh, but I really do appreciate uh, people coming, and I really want to thank both Tatiana and Geronimo for having me and accommodating me. Uh, it's been a very, very fun session for me, so thank you very much. No, thank you for being here. You even have people from Argentina listening to you. Um, Mateo, you want yeah. to say something? Thank you. I, I, I hear you in great times you just say about the paper and the thing that uh, you work, you have been working in. So where can we get that? Where can they read it? Okay. I don't know. Yeah, this, is the, uh, this is the shitty thing about being an academic. When I was in a band, you know, you, you made a record and you just put it out. Academics, it's like, oh, it's coming out soon. It should be out. Uh, next winter. Uh, and unfortunately, that is the situation we're in. Uh, we gave it to Palgrave um, in August, and it should be published next August. Uh, so um, we're, wow. we're hoping to apply for research grants, and we're hoping to build this into something bigger. Uh, but that chapter will be out in August, 
Um, and uh, yeah, I will definitely let everybody know when it's out. I, we're very happy with, with how it came out. Um, yeah, but it's, but, but it, it, uh, it's going to take a while to actually see the light of day. I may, it may be online sooner than that. I hope it is. All right. Um, Luke, just so you know, you have two Brazilian uh, fans in the chat room. As well. No, I, I have to say I have a complex uh, relationship with Brazil uh, because it looks like a beautiful country, uh, but I'm an Italian soccer fan. So I always have a weird, but I'm very grateful that they're here and I hope to go to Brazil one day. Uh, and congratulations on beating Pe uh, Peru last night. Yeah. Don't, don't even <laughs> mention football. I know, I know. Don't, don't even it's go very there. very dangerous. Uh, don't even go there. It's a very dangerous topic. Don't topic. go that way in Latin America. The only yeah. acceptable word today, I think, is Peckerman. We're allowed to say Peckerman and that's no, it. That's all. No, no, don't, don't even talk about football. Um, but we do know we have two from Brazil, three or four from Argentina, which is fantastic. Yeah, we have somebody um, from Peru as well. Uh, somebody from Peru uh, and uh, Rebecca uh, is, yeah. is from Mexico, so there you go. Um, so, so it's not all Los Andes students. That's great, great. All right. So thank you, thank you, Luke, for the presentation. It was great, and uh, it's a not very uh, common topic, I would say. So we learn a lot from your research and your colleague. And uh, if you want to be with us in the future, please let us know. This is your house as well. So oh, thank you, Tatiana. I really, uh, I really appreciate that. And uh, yes, I would love to do another talk sometime soon. Great. All right. Muchas um, gracias a todos. Te dejo la palabra para que cierres, Jerónimo. Ah, bueno, muy bien. Gracias, Tatiana. Um, I'm going to close in Spanish, Luke, so you have to put up with it. Gracias. Eh, muchas gracias a todos por su asistencia. Creo que la sesión de hoy es bien, fue bien interesante por muchas razones. Primero, como les decía, porque logramos juntar los dos temas en los que trabaja la que son Asia y África. Eh, hoy desde un punto de vista un poco más histórico, pero creo, creo que es bien interesante ver esas interacciones que no solemos ver dentro del sur global y dentro de estas dinámicas sur-sur. Eh, y al mismo tiempo creo que es interesante en el marco de, de, de lo que estamos tratando de hacer tanto en Alada, con Diálogos Alada y con Alada en general, como en la red latinoamericana de estudios africanos, es empezar a ver cuáles son los temas que la gente está trabajando eh, sobre África en América Latina, que son extremadamente diversos y que nos han llevado desde los, las rutas de migración a través de Níger hasta los vínculos entre Vietnam y África el día de hoy. Y creo que eso lo que está haciendo es es generando un grupo de, de, de personas interesadas en África que estamos aprendiendo un montón de cosas, de, de temas que jamás pensábamos que íbamos a poder aprender desde América Latina, que creo que eso es fantástico porque estamos viendo la riqueza de la investigación en América Latina. Eh, creo que Luke es el primer no latinoamericano que nos habla de África, porque habíamos tenido coreanos hablando de Asia y eso, pero creo que es el primer no latinoamericano que nos habla de África que además es fantástico porque está haciendo su investigación desde Colombia. Entonces creo que es, que es bien interesante alguien canadiense trabajando en Colombia investigando sobre África. Eh, creo que tú eres más raro que yo, Luke. Yo al menos soy colombiano trabajando en Colombia investigando sobre África. Tú tienes un elemento adicional. Pero muchas gracias. Eh, para nosotros fue un placer tenerte. Para nosotros fue un placer tenerlos a todos ustedes. Y los esperamos en la próxima sesión de Diálogo Salada, que si no estoy mal, es sobre el conflicto en Cabo Delgado, en Mozambique, Cabo y la presencia de grupos islamistas en el norte de Mozambique, que va a estar absolutamente fantástico. Y la hace uh -huh. Ricardo Benítez, Benítez, de ANUAR, la Asociación de Naciones Unidas eh, para la República Argentina. Eh, ¿Y será cuándo, eh, Tatiana? El 26... 26 ya de te noviembre. confirmo, 26 de noviembre. Perfecto. Eh, Tatiana les estará enviando por correo electrónico a todos la información. Muy bien. Muchísimas gracias a todos por acompañarnos y que tengan una muy feliz tarde. Gracias. Chao. Chao. Chao gracias. Thank you.